with Malcolm Harkins uh, and then followed Malcolm uh, with Dr. Courtney Holliday from MD Anderson and, and we are privileged to have Mark Varner uh, join us today. Uh, just as a quick uh, heads up and, and, and recap for how these go, and by the way, my name is Tim Rischolte, I'm the CEO of the Professional Development Academy and on behalf of everyone here at the Academy, uh, welcome uh, and it's certainly great to have everyone joining us here throughout this webinar series and uh, at any time throughout this, uh, this, this hour uh, that we have together, feel free to use the webinar uh, chat box to drop in a question, a comment. We'll certainly relay that to Mark. Uh, if you want to raise a question yourself, we're certainly uh, more than happy to open up your microphone and you can uh, direct your comments and questions to Mark uh, yourself. Uh, either way is fine for us, so feel free to use that chat box. We'll be monitoring that here throughout the webinar. And as mentioned, uh, it's great to have Mark. You know, Mark has, you know, is actually one of the first ones uh, of the executives that we worked with at the Professional Development Academy back, you know, five years ago now in 2014. Uh, I remember being in New York. Uh, Mark was at a summit at that time. I met uh, Mark. You'll remember this as well. You know, we met in New York. Uh, we spent probably the better part of, uh, of an hour uh, videotaping. Uh, you were providing content for the Professional Development Academy and as folks can see here based on your bio, you know, you've got uh, a couple decades of experience and what is really great and you all are going to recognize this and many of you already have because many of you tuning in have been through the Professional Development Academy and so you saw Mark and learned from Mark virtually based on the videos that he provided and you know about his expertise. You know certainly that he has technical security capabilities to understand cyber threats and, and creating cyber, cyber preparedness for his organizations. Uh, you know, previous to Yum Brands was at McDonald's, uh, now at Yum Brands. Um, you know, but in addition to that, Mark really has the ability to balance what's necessary for security preparedness, security readiness, and security uh, when it comes to brand, when it comes to intellectual property, when it comes to data, when it comes to personnel, when it comes to customers but also has the ability to balance that with the, the business side of the organization, the enterprise, and really understand the business needs of security and make sure that security doesn't get in the way of the execution of business, but actually supports that process uh, and, and able to balance that appropriately. And so, uh, Mark, thank you so much for, uh, you know, the journey that you've taken with us as part of the Professional Development Academy, and specifically thank you, Mark, for taking the time out of your schedule to be with us today as part of this webinar series. We're certainly looking forward to you sharing your executive insights on leadership and a bit of your journey as well as taking some questions from the participants. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Cool. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I'd, I'll probably put in next year for you to do my review because you make me sound a lot smarter than my boss does. So I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, the, uh, the one thing I would probably just as a as a, a precursor to all of that is that as I go through this, um, you know, I'll I'll bore myself of listening to myself in in ten minutes. So if there are questions or something like that, I would strongly encourage you know either send them in or uh, and I don't know if you know Tim or you guys see the chat and you can relay those through or whatever the case is, but um, I would strongly encourage you know I would like this to be you know more of uh, you know, dialogue in nature than just me sort of waxing poetic for 30 minutes about, um, you know, what I think because it's a lot more important. Uh, and I think this is probably the first lesson that I would uh, convey in leadership. Uh, it's probably a lot more important that I'm hearing what's important to you um, as opposed to what I think um, because as leaders uh, or as humans, I think that we can tend to believe or overbelieve that we have all of that solved and we actually have the answers and in many cases we're not even necessarily looking at the right questions so um you know i, I certainly encourage you to send anything in and to be able to uh, talk about that and i would be glad to share uh, you know the insights it's leadership i guess to me is a whole lot of um it's a lot like what I tell my kids all the time is that it's about finding 937 ways not to make a light bulb sometimes before you make a light bulb. So 
we we want to get things as right as we can. I think what's even more important as a leader is that you learn to do course correction. And uh, I have a good friend of mine that uh, is a pilot for American Airlines, and we were having this discussion one day, and he said something that has, has resonated with me or stuck with me for a long time. And I don't even know how we got on the subject. I think it was because some plane had gotten off course or whatever the case is and I mean like very off course and we sat there and talked about like how can that possibly happen anyway um in my pea brain um you know I imagine what happens is the plane takes off and it's like you know your your nav in your car and you punch in a you know an address and the nav goes and you know you wind up at the address and it tells you every 15 seconds that you're supposed to take a left or you're continue to go straight and that was kind of that what I didn't know is that on an average flight from, you know, Chicago to Atlanta, I think we had talked about, he said that the, the navigational system probably makes 800 or 900 course corrections. And I found it very interesting in that um, many times as leaders and many times as followers, uh, we tend to think in our organizations or in anything in any aspect of our job that we're just going to sort of put these coordinates in, we're going to set the strategy, and then we're going to execute the strategy. Uh, and I think as leaders, we probably do ourselves a disservice if we don't, on the front end of that, recognize that along that way, there's going to be a whole lot of navigational adjustments that need to be made. And I think that that's really what separates good leaders from mediocre leaders, is the ability to be able to set a strategy, set a vision, um, but then also remain flexible and open enough to know that you're not going to, going to have gotten that 100% right, or your team's not going to be able to execute that to the exact level that you thought, or your organization's not going to be able to consume it the way that you thought. So um, unfortunately, leadership is a lot like a mathematical equation with a lot more variables and not very many constants. And I think where we really separate ourselves as, as leaders is in being better at dealing with those variables, having predicted them to the greatest degree that we possibly can, and then sort of moving, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the items around, uh, if you will, on the deck appropriately so that you can then adjust your strategy as you're moving forward. So um, ideally, I, I think that that's probably you know, the first point that I would convey that is one of the more critical aspects to being a, um, an effective leader. And then as I started to think of some of the other things that um, I would probably convey based upon because uh, we can all lead, you can bury yourself in leadership books. There's um, Tim's probably already written one, in fact, um, and they're all good. Uh, I think the purpose of these and one of the things that I would certainly advise is that um, if you're looking to become a better leader, find a good leader that you admire and that you trust. Um, and that's not to say, and, and I, I wouldn't look at only that side of the equation. That's also another thing that I think that we make a fatal mistake on many times is that as, um, as up and coming leaders, we tend to look at great leaders and we replicate that, which is a good thing. But there's also a lot that can be learned from the other aspects of life as well. So I would I'd probably submit that I have, I have learned as much by observing poor leadership, and unfortunately, sometimes having been the one that was giving poor leadership, uh, as I have by observing really good leadership or reading all the leadership self-help books uh, in the world. Uh, the one thing that I would probably bring up uh, on the onset of this is that being a couple of things, being a leader is scary, um, and being a leader requires vulnerability. And I think those two aspects, you know, we tend to sometimes assume that as the leader, uh, we all have these pictures of the leaders and it's either our high school football coach or it's General Patton or it's somebody that was very strong willed. Uh, they had a big presence 
and when they walked in a room, you knew it and you knew who was in charge and all of those other things. And those sometimes those things are true. Those are actually only one characteristic that's important to becoming a really good leader. And I think that the the other side of that is being able to where where you see that overdrawn is where a leader doesn't necessarily feel secure in being vulnerable. And being vulnerable doesn't mean that you're going to come in and tell somebody your life story and uh, how hard it is at the house and whatever the dog ate your homework. Um, vulnerable, in this, vulnerable in this aspect is that if you think about um, poor leaders that you've ever had, and one of the worst characteristics I think that any of us probably have experienced in dealing with a past leader is if you've ever dealt with somebody that's always right. Um, people that are always right don't actually tend to be smarter than any of the rest of us. Uh, they just tend to be narcissistic and think that they're always right. Um, and a lot of that then stems from them not being able to be vulnerable and, and, and adjust. It's that navigational adjustment that I was talking about before. Um, and being able to come forward and say, okay, well, Maybe that wasn't the greatest idea in the world, and um, we should probably shift gears. In order to do that, in order to say that your strategy wasn't the greatest or you didn't have the best idea, but somebody else did, uh, requires a certain amount of vulnerability because as leaders, we think it's just a natural reaction. We tend to think that we're always supposed to be right. And I think it has shifted within the last you know 10 years, probably culturally in most companies where that's not really necessarily the case anymore. And the more successful leaders are the ones that uh, are more willing to collaborate, to listen to ideas, to be able to take all of that input and then combine that into um, a larger strategy. I still think it's the leader's responsibility to give the vision, to give the strategy, to provide the direction, um, and more than anything, you know, to provide the motivation and, and knock down roadblocks. That's really where I end up finding most of my job uh, to be. And as Tim alluded to in sort of my introduction, um, I started with a lot, a lot of people that have been in, in this particular space for a long time when, you know, I was going through uh, my earlier career, uh, keep in mind that a, the, a CISO, or for that matter, a security person, didn't really exist. So, you know, as, as you know, people lament about, oh my gosh, what am I going to go to school for? And I've got to get my major right, and I've got to know exactly what it is that uh, I'm doing. Sometimes it's comical for me because what I have now spent my life doing and enjoy more than anything else, and I think what is the greatest job in the world, uh, didn't even exist. Uh, when we were looking at careers, uh, you know, nobody actually ever even thought of this. Uh, yet here we are. So I think the, um, you know, one of the things that's very, you know, would be very helpful is to understand, you know, being able to navigate that journey, be flexible enough to understand that you are indeed not going to have all the right answers, um, and other people are going to be able to provide those things, but um, I was fortunate enough to come up through sort of the technical means, and it gave me an advantage early in my career in being able to lead and understand because there is a certain help that when people come in and there's technical issues or there's things that are happening, um, you do have some sort of, um, uh, I guess, experience or authority to be able to understand the issue and offer something that looks like um, workable advice. That said, you know, one of the things that um, I have found, I don't want to say somewhat challenging, but, but certainly something that I've had to focus and concentrate on is honing my skills in the other areas um, and being able to let go of some of those old things. And uh, I, would, I would probably submit that, you know, all of us are on a different journey in that regard because uh, which I think is a good thing right now in security, which has changed in the last probably five to 10 years, is that traditionally when you came into this, you came in the exact way I did, which was you were an IT person or you were some technical background, you got into security, and then um, you somehow worked your way up the food chain and 
and became a, a leader or a manager and then, you know, just progressively got larger roles. I think we're getting a lot of people that are coming in from various backgrounds these days. So the, the theory still remains true, however, which is that in order to advance in anything, you have to be willing to let go of some of the other things. Um, we tend to think that we can still gobble that up and just gain more knowledge and take those things and we'll still retain all of that other stuff. Uh, the problem is, is that in this particular world, that other stuff that you used to do changes at an amazingly rapid pace. And though I used to administer a firewall a long time ago, um, I probably, you probably don't want me administering your firewall these days. Um, that's not because I couldn't retain what I used to do. It's just the firewall and the GUI and everything else that I used to do doesn't exist anymore and it hasn't existed in 10 years. And so those things have advanced, but that's okay. I've had to let, let some of those things go. I still understand the concept, which is what's important. Now, that's my sort of cross to bear is the technical side of that. Some of you may be coming from other backgrounds um, and that's going to be one of the things that you have to be able to become comfortable with to sort of accelerate as a leader is looking at some of those other things that you're gonna to need to let go. And I would just say that you would, you know, I would encourage you to sit down, take a very serious look at that, <clears throat> even draw up a plan or do a stakeholder management plan or something like that, where you can be very thoughtful um, and, and very predictable as to what it is that you want to accomplish and what are those things that you're going to need to be comfortable letting go of as you start to move and progress uh, through um, some of those, uh, some of those, uh, uh, that maturation process. The other, okay, so Mark, yep. Mark, I was just going to add, there, there's a, a question that just came in uh, regarding exactly the topic you're bringing up, uh, because you're right, there are many individuals that, you know, they start off on the technical side, wherever that technical side is, if it is IT or technical HR or technical operations, you know, for your purposes, we're talking about technical IT, uh, managing that firewall, managing that interface, managing the switches and, 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 and devices. Uh, but at some point, you decided to move into, you know, the CISO role, move up into the organization, which many individuals do. I've heard you mention before, I'm going to bring up a quote that I'm familiar with and then bring that into the question that came about. And the, the question is specific to the stakeholder uh, management process you talked about and how do you do that when you are on the technical side wanting to move into the leadership side, possibly becoming the CISO. I know one of the comments you had made uh, to me early on in our conversations about the academy was the importance that uh, your specific quote was, we all learn on the fringes of what we already know. And I would imagine as you went through the technical beginnings of your career to now CISO, you continually learned on the fringe of what you already knew and needed to let go of some of the things that you knew, the technical side, to then branch out into much more business savvy, business uh, wise perspectives uh, uh, when it comes to, in this case, Yum Brands and other organizations you've been at in the past. Can you, uh, the, the question is, can you share a little bit more about that stakeholder management process to really understand how do you navigate to, to build a network and build knowledge about the business when you are still at the technical side and move yourself into higher levels of leadership roles? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I really do have a formal stakeholder management plan and it's, it's two pages and it basically takes me through and it, it, it forces you to write down who's really important to your career. And that can be pro proactive or it can be current. So I have a list and obviously today, you know, that's the COO of my company it's the brand leadership, it's the audit committee, it's also every member of my team, um, as well as some of the extended business partners in digital and legal that are that have high, they're high influencers upon my success. And it really is as simple as sitting down, writing down those names, and then making a, and I, it's nothing more than a, it's a glorified Excel spreadsheet that says, how is the relationship today? Is it, is it even? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? Um, and then a, a, a block that goes across that says, how do, what do I want them 
them to know? How do I want them to feel? Uh, what do I need them to act on for me? Uh, and it prioritizes them, uh, which sounds very cold and callous, but um, it prioritizes them based upon what, what impact do they have against either the agenda that I'm trying to get done at Young or against my career. And what you'll find is by going through that formality, um, again, which sounds very cold and callous, but I, I promise it's a, it's a productive use of time because what you can find out is that you may be forging the best relationship with somebody in your company that actually has very little to do with how effective you are at what they're paying you for. And that can happen at a lower technical version and that can happen all the way at the CISO level because we all have um, those relationships that we need to manage. Now, uh, to direct exactly what Tim is talking about though, is, is what does that mean from a technical person who's trying to get up to that next level? Um, you need to be very purposeful about putting people within that stakeholder community that will indeed bring you up to that next level. Um, they may come to you and they may say, hey, we want you to have further opportunity because we really think you're a great person and have a lot of capability and potential. And that's terrific. Companies, generally speaking, we call them hypos, but we're very good at going through and calibrating on high potential candidates that we think should have um, future opportunity. However, you can manage your own career and you can take part in that by actively going out and pursuing, well, who are those people? Go find a couple mentors that can help you do that, put them on your stakeholder management plan and be very purposeful and direct about understanding what it is that you need to do in order to be you know, able or to put yourself. Sometimes it's as simple um, as making yourself available and letting people know that you are interested in that. And, and I have very real examples in my career where as silly as we think they are, um, we had a, a gap in, in our um, we call them IEPs, I think, individual development plans. And it said, would you be open for an assignment somewhere else um, outside of the country? And I said, sure. Um, believe it or not, a year later, an assignment came up. I actually had that on my sheet. And so I made the interview list, very, very long story short. Um, it turned into a, a massive career move. I was expatted to a foreign country, um, ran a security operation over there. I would have never, ever had that opportunity had I not simply written something down and let somebody know uh, that I was interested. So um, sometimes it's just about letting people know that you are, you know, available for those types of things. And then, you know, again, like I said before, being a leader is scary. Um, the quote that you're seeing that I made before is just that. Um, so that's a simple thing to say. It's a scary thing to do um, because it is the truth. We all learn on the fringes of what we already know. And much of your growth and where you can go is really very dependent upon how much you're able to live on that fringe. And the fact that, you know, it's not always going to be solid and steady and easy. And the more on that fringe you get, um, the less stable it becomes. However, it also, you know, is a super accelerator to your growth pattern. Um, the only other thing that I would add to that is you have to gauge your organization and take an honest look at that. And are they the type of organization that rewards that? Um, I can tell you here, like there's four core elements that Greg Creed, uh, our CEO, looks at. Uh, one, of those, uh, one of those elements is courage. Um, and he actually is a very big proponent of, of courage because he has recognized and knows that as a brand, we can move fast, we have to be innovative, we have to do cool and, and different things. But in order to do that, you have to be brave. Um, and it takes courage to be able to do that. Now, I'm very blessed that we're in an organization where that courage um, is recognized, and it's also recognized that if you're going to be courageous, you're probably going to fail. Um, and I used to have a, a, a boss that told me one time that, because um, I thought that I had really screwed up and I had really done something bad, <clears throat> and I came into the office and I thought, oh man, I am really going to get blasted. And he said, well, you know what? If you're not making mistakes, it really kind of tells me that you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Um, and it was an eye 
opening experience is probably the biggest favor that one of my leaders has ever done because it sort of set me on a path to understand that um, that is a truth. And, and, you know, you will need to find people in your organization that will support you in that um, so that you can move forward uh, because it does take, you know, living on the edge a bit. That doesn't mean that you make stupid decisions or that you do things that, um, you know, you don't necessarily get any agreement or seek advice on or anything like that. Um, but it does mean that you need to push hard because they are looking for you to be different. Um, you know, that, that is the differentiator between leadership. Yeah, thanks, Mark. One other question that came in, it harkens back to the, uh, the, the comment you were making about the, the navigation system in our vehicles. And they had mentioned that, you know, the navigation systems often rely significantly on feedback. You know, you put in your navigation, this is where I want to go, it knows where you're currently at, it plots out a destination map for you to travel, and then as you go forward, as you were mentioning, course correcting along the way, there's that constant feedback that you're getting from the satellite system to the navigation to where you're currently at to where you're going. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you go about getting feedback to help you in the role that you have uh, at Yumbren. Yeah, in fact, that's a great observation, and I'll give you how stupid we are sometimes as 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 leaders. Um, <clears throat> if you think back to when navigation systems first came out, that didn't necessarily exist. Like they were smart, and they knew the topographical and the the roads and all those other things, but they weren't smart enough because we didn't use crowdsourcing or anything like that. So the Difference between the early navs and ways um, is a great example of this, if you want to think of it that way, where nav was nice because it's going to tell you where you need to go. Ways was better because it took in a whole bunch of information and input, and then it actually made it even more valuable because, yes, that road will get you there, but there's also a major accident, and it's completely shut down, and it's going to be three hours until that thing's opened back up. The nav road was right. But the information that you're getting from Waze is far better because it's more informed. So I think that's a great example of those feedback mechanisms. So number one is your stakeholder management plan, because if you have those things and you're constantly calibrating on those things, how do they feel? What do you want them to know? How do you need them to act? Um, you are indeed meeting with those folks and you're getting those feedback mechanisms. You know, the, the common thing is, is especially if you're in our business, people ask all the time, you know, like, well, okay, well, how do you know what the next sandwich is to come out with? Or how do you know, you know, what, where you should turn your product or should the pizzas be thick, um, uh, thick crust or thin crust? Or there's a zillion questions that come up that every day our business leaders have to navigate that. Well, the easy way to do that is ask your customer. That's why customer loyalty and all those other things are so important because it gets to the heart of the customer customer sentiment. And therefore it becomes pretty simple just to make a better product. Um, so I think sometimes we overcomplicate that. Um, the easiest way to figure that out is ask. And I think sometimes where as leaders, what, what I find most important that um, I, I have set up, in fact, I just went through a pretty large reorganization. And one of the reasons that I did that is that um, the, the way that we were gaining a 360 view of how we were doing was okay. Um, it, was, it was a bit forced and clunky because to the point, I could always go out and ask, hey, how is this service? Um, are we providing what it is that we, you know, you need to know? Um, is the SLA correct? Are we doing this fast enough? And I can send out surveys and all those other things. But one of the things I think as a leader was my responsibility. Um, and again, um, we had to do some centralization and things like that. And that is not a natural, you know, just being transparent, that is not a very natural thing at Yum. Yum is three brands in corporate and the brands like to act, you know, with their own autonomy. And in many of aspects of our business, that works really, really well because Taco Bell is very different than Pizza Hut, which is different than KFC. They're almost like children. They have their own personalities. Um, in my little world, though, that doesn't necessarily work very well. However, um, that's not how the organization works. So when I came and said, okay, well, we need to do some things differently because 
my responsibility is to make sure that that feedback mechanism in that loop operates as efficiently as it possibly can because it's very important to secure our environment. Um, getting that information back from, we're in 146 countries and we're three brands. So if you multiply that out, that's really what my customer list looks like. Um, and trying to make all those people happy or understand sort of that environment um, is really, really complex. And so the efficiency of that feedback mechanism is very, very important. And the organization didn't necessarily lend itself to make that as good as it could possibly be. Therefore, my responsibility as a leader was to be bold, be courageous, do what I felt was the right thing for the business and our shareholders and my executives that, that I'm, I'm protecting um, uh, and, and our customers, and then take that and, and, and put the organization in place that would be the right thing to be able to get that 360 foot or 360 degree view and the feedback that we need uh, on a constant basis. And, and as the, so that's a macro level of it. I think you also have to answer the smaller level of it, which is we all have a very tight um, circle that really, really is important for us to influence. For me, there's an executive staff and a COO and an audit committee that is, you know, really a very tight circle of few people. So it, there, you know, you can be more informal. And sometimes I think it is as simple as just asking questions and saying, is this the right information? Is this hitting the right level? Are we missing things that um, you, know, you think you need to know? So I think you have to use both of those tools, um, but you have to be able to figure out where and when you know, to pick those things and be very purposeful about them. Yeah, and I think your your you know just simple statement as well about you've got to ask. I think that intentionality is so important, and really just getting to that asking part really starts that dialogue. And if you align that with the stakeholder map that you have, and knowing your core customers, the executive staff, CO, audit committee, others as it might be for other individuals, uh, goes a long way in ter terms of getting that feedback. Because you, you, if if you don't ask, you're certainly going to limit yourself. You know, one thing you just mentioned, Mark and Andre. I see your, uh, your question in the chat box. I'm going to get to that in just a second, so thank you for, for, for dropping that in. Uh, but Mark, one of the things you had mentioned was when you come into Yum Brands, there's some things that you want to do. It reminded me of another quote that I know that you have mentioned, and we bring it up as part of the academy as well. And I'll bring it up here to see if you want to chat a little bit about that, and that is not being afraid of doing something different than your predecessor. And so I think that probably plays into what you were just mentioning regarding your work at Yum Brands because no doubt it probably would be comfortable and easier if you do just kind of step in, fill in the role of the prior CISO uh, or whatever the prior role an individual it was and the position you currently have. It's easier to continue to do the same thing you've always done, but that's not always what is best for the business or best for your career uh, in your case as a, as a chief security officer. It, it's very true, and I don't know why we fall in, into this. Um, I think it's because, you know, again, we don't, especially if you're the new person, right, we don't like conflict. We don't want to be the squeaky wheel. We want to fit in, and, and when I first got to McDonald's, um, and Yum has a very strong culture as well, but McDonald's was, you know, kind of known for, like, um, organ projection is what they used to call it, is that if you came in um, and you really tried to shift too much, it was very difficult on you and you, you'd have someone look at you and go, oh, by the way, I just want you to know, you know, we've been wildly successful for 55 years without you and stock has, you know, split 37 times and there's janitors running around here that are going to retire millionaires. So, you know, there's that. It's easy to be intimidated um, because they're right on all counts. You are a very small spoke and a very large wheel at the same time. The thing that I always had to keep in the back of my mind is that if they just wanted the same thing, um, they wouldn't have made a change in most instances. Uh, so, you know, keep in mind that it may seem bold and new and all of those other things, but in many instances, that's kind of what the organization is looking for. And they're probably more, it, now that said, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be easy. Um, I'm, I'm also fond of saying, you know, this stuff is, is, is simple, but it's not easy. Um, the, the, the thought process behind that is that, you know, sometimes it's, 
um, sort of like giving kids medicine, um, you know, even they know that they need it because they don't feel good, but it still doesn't make getting it down their throat any easier sometimes. And I think that's the art of leadership is that you have to walk that balance and be able to um, give the patient what they need, uh, but be able to do it in a way that doesn't completely disrupt, you know, their business or make everyone feel like what they were doing before was a complete and utter failure. Um, and that's where I think some of the, the art of being able to do that is, and we've had those discussions here where the fact that we want to do something different doesn't mean that how it was being done before was wrong. It just means sometimes that the business has changed or the pace has changed. And certainly in security, that is the easiest argument in the world to make because, you know, in fact, I'll give you a very practical uh, example, credential stuffing. Um, right now in retail, and if you have a loyalty program, credential stuffing is the rage, and it's hitting us every single day, and we have more of that hitting all of our sites. Six months ago, that was it wasn't even existent in any of our dialogue, and yet I'm spending a considerable amount of money and time and resource right now solving that problem. So I don't I don't think there's any any shame in necessarily having to make any changes or 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 um, uh, look differently at how we do things. And sometimes I think organizations can take that very personally um, when you're the person coming in and being that agent of change. So I think when you're an agent of change, you need to you need to have the boldness to do what's right, but you also have to have the tact to be able to explain that in a way that is not going to seem like you're just trudging upon people who, in in all you know accounts, have been working tirelessly for a long time to get to where they are. And I think being cognizant of that is the most important thing because where you really lose track of that is that, and you get that bull in a, in, in a, in a China shop sort of um, um, look is when you don't think about those things before you start making some of your changes. And I would just, I would, I would submit that a little empathy and a little um, sort of thought go a really, really, really long way when you start doing those things. Yeah, I'm going to come back to the, the need for empathy here in a, in a future question in about a few minutes, but I want to get to Andre's question here. And, and Mark, Andre is a non-technical individual with a pretty serious uh, challenge and looking for your recommendation. He says, Mark, what would be your recommendation on how to motivate and build a team of technical people when you're leading this group without deep technical knowledge yourself? Um, well, I would say lean in on the strengths that you have because they can be highly technical, but I promise you they don't have some of the other strengths that you probably do. Um, you know, they're, that's, that's sort of, I'm fond of saying um, in, in a lot of my team, because one of the things a lot of times you've got to watch out for is that people don't want to challenge you as a leader. And uh, in order to overcome that all the time, I tell people, well, if I'm always right, one of this is unnecessary. Um, and, you know, I need my paycheck, so I can tell you which one's going to go. Um, it, you know, the, the, it sounds funny, but the point is, is that everybody has different ideas and everybody has different talents. So, uh, and I know this sounds cliche, but cliches are cliches for a reason. That's because they're generally right and broadly uh, applicable. And I would tell you that you probably have things to offer uh, that they don't necessarily get. You know, a lot of times, and, you know, I find in security groups, you know, the, my technical, my highest technical people can sometimes be our biggest detractors because they get in a room and they go to explain something. And, you know, generally speaking, the people that are your stakeholders that you need to influence and help and look at as your customers don't understand the thing in the world that you're talking about. You know, some of these concepts uh, are so foreign to them and it's even gotten better because executives and people are just becoming more aware of security just because of where it sits in the world. But um, generally speaking, you know, our most technical people are not the ones that are really, really savvy at explaining that. And, and at the end of the day, I'm fond of, you know, sort of, of, of reminding my group that the very people that we need to support us, to sign checks, to, um, you know, put things through and in place uh, to better secure the organization, do not understand all of our technical mumbo jumbo, nor do they care. So your 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 sweet spot may be in uh, I like to talk or I like to call it um, being able to speak analog and digital. 
is that your big gift may be being able to take some of that digital input and then turn that into analog um, and serve your group in a way that the rest of them wouldn't be able to do. Now, that's true. You're not managing a firewall and you're not the technical genius. But frankly, being the technical genius isn't it is going to do no good if you're not translating that to executives or there's not if awareness is not you know raising in your organization. So I mean I don't know the exact situation or what you know the talents and things like that are, but I would certainly say that diversity is a good thing in that regard, and it's just all about picking how do you use that particular talent um, that still builds the team. And, 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 I also don't want to shove aside the fact that, unfortunately, there is a bit of te technical bigotry that can exist where, well, if you don't understand how technical I am in all these aspects, um, you can't possibly, you know, lead me. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something that you just have to manage through because um, that's not true at all. Um, but there, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that that does not exist in, in some places. Yeah, certainly a challenge. And, and uh, Andre appreciates the, uh, the, the response, as do I. Uh, you know, you had mentioned, and this is a follow-up question to that in terms of managing teams. Uh, you had mentioned that YUM operates in 146 different countries. Uh, can you share that the question is, can you share a little bit about the challenges and how to overcome the challenges of managing a highly distributed team? Um, yeah, carefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, probably one of the biggest challenges I would say um, that we have, and I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer. All I can give you is, is how we attacked that. Um, I think more important is recognizing, as a leader, recognizing what are your big challenges. So a lot of people will come in and they will say, I, you know, I would, I would, um, I'd challenge you to ask um, a couple, what, so what, you know, questions, because I think you'll need to get to the root of what's really causing your challenges. So I could have come into this job and said, holy crow, we got 146 different markets and they're not secure because they're markets and they act like they do and they're just different countries and they wanna spin things up. Um, gosh, how are we gonna do this? Okay, well, we're gonna go talk to all of them. Well, it, what I did is, and luckily I have experience in having done this with another um, very large, very similar you know, company, but having already gone through that, well, so what question is, it brought me back to, okay, well, at the root of it, why are they not doing that? What is the true business challenge to how do you get security into 146 markets across three brands? Because when you go to a market, the Pizza Hut office is different than the KFC office. They're actually two completely different entities. So um, it truly is 146 countries times three sometimes. And when you go in there, what I had to do is figure out, okay, well, what is really the challenge? Well, the challenge is uh, they're small. Um, their, their IT shops are very, very thin. They run on razor margins because um, it's not a big gigantic bank or it's not a big single company. These are all a collection of small P&Ls and they're held very, very tightly to be um, you know, as cost efficient as they possibly can. So resource sophistication, imagine if you tried to put a security person in every one of those markets. You know, resources are one of our big issues right now. There's no way I could ever resource to that. So the strategy that we moved to was security as a service. And so what I have been able to do is combine our teams together. And we do, if you look at a typical IT uh, model, we do design, build, and then operationally I get run out of the building as fast as I can. But what we do is if you think of a security service as your own little lemonade stand, we turn that thing, that widget, antivirus, anti-malware, firewall management, name your security widget, we turn that into a service and then at no profit or anything like that, we combine that and then we will offer that to the market. So the market gets a world-class security service that they are essentially buying from us, but they're really not buying anything. They're just paying for it, but they pay for it as they need it. Um, and they're getting a great uh, uh, price and benefit on it because we're 
doing it as an aggregate. So they're getting the power of a company that, that runs 46,000 restaurants instead of being one little market going out and trying to negotiate a contract with a security widget. Now, I tell you all that not because that's terribly important. What is important is that I recognized what the real business problem was, why something was occurring at its root level, and then addressed that. So instead of, um, uh, instead of trying to feed morphine to the patient and calling them cured, um, what we really had to do was get to the root of what was causing the actual um, sickness and then finding out how in the world do you address that at the deep level. And I just you know, I think you have to dig and figure that out <clears throat> and look at it in that regard as opposed to can you just immediately solve the problem? Because as a leader, your job is vision and strategy in the long term, not necessarily just tactfully taking care of a problem. Yeah, it further emphasizes the, the importance of that stakeholder map and the relationship management and the intentionality behind that that you were mentioning earlier. Uh, another question that came in is, in your, and this is a, always an interesting question to ask a, a security officer, and it's, uh, it might be one of those things where it's a simple question, but maybe not so easy to answer, and that is, uh, what keeps you up at night? I have two daughters and two sons, so I have lots of things to keep me up at night. Um, the, <laughs> so I think um, governance and visibility, I, I guess, would be my um, my two things. So, so to me, in fact, I just had a, a, a meeting with our GLT, which is our global leadership team, uh, yesterday, and. I really only give them three big rocks of, you know, what, where are we working? What are our issues? You know, what do we really need to do? And uh, governance and visibility was one of those things because uh, for me, and again, this is knowing your business. Now, if I was, you know, Craig at, at Bank of America, it might be different or Dave at Starbucks, although they probably have the same problem. Um, the, the visibility and governance for me is the bigger issue because we're a very distributed environment. Like I told you, you know, there's three brands, multiple countries, it works out to somewhere around 241 permutations of the market. Um, and so governing that, and even worse, visibility is really, really difficult, like gaining that. I don't have sensors in every one of those markets or whatever the case is, um, you know, automatically telling me where their risk posture is. So, um, you know, one of the, the common things I'll say is that I can't protect what I don't know about. And so for me, knowledge is power. And being able to understand what that landscape is, I can I can then address it. I can go in and tell my leadership, look, here's our risks. Here's how much it's going to cost us to solve those things. Here's the runway. Here's some risk-based decisions you need to make. Like, is is the squeeze worth the juice based upon these markets? Do we really worry about that? Versus, you know, we've got databases over here that you know have really really large stores of data customer or, or customer information. Do we want to concentrate on those things? Those are real decisions that you have to make every single day. The thing with a risk-based decision, however, is that as all of us know, you cannot make a, a risk-based decision without being appropriately informed. So information is the number one key factor to being able to make a good risk-based decision. And if you looked at our vision statement, or I'm sorry, our mission statement as a group, um, and I just realized this the other day, um, security isn't even mentioned in it. Um, it says something to the effect of our, our goal is to ensure that our leadership is making informed risk-based decisions about our enterprise. Um, and that's why I change, like I'm, everybody knows, I, I hate the term information security group. Um, I changed the name of it when we got here to global technology risk management. And because I'm, you know, I've, I've often said any idiot can secure a computer, just throw it in the ocean. Um, it's also going to be useless as a business tool. Um, what the art and really what we get paid, what we get paid for is to be able to help the organization navigate risk, not make it secure. Um, and so I think if you look at it in the, that lens, and I think that, you know, that's one of the things I wanted to get back to, Tim, you had mentioned a couple of times intentionality, and I cannot overemphasize how important that is because um, empathy and being, being intentional, asking questions, being a participant, being a student of the business, all of those things up your credibility as a leader more than all the words in a thousand years will do.
um, because it shows your interest. It shows that you understand that you're not just a security person, but you're there to participate in the business. And when I look at my role, yes, my number one accountability is to ensure that our shareholders and our customers and our leadership and our employees are protected. And that, that is also in our vision statement and never leaves my side. However, I'm also a corporate vice president and um, I always am sitting and thinking about what is the business implication of these things. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to run one of our brands anytime soon. But what it does mean is that when I sit down with Artie, who is the guy, the CEO that runs Pizza Hut, and I have thought through some things and I said, we really, really need to do this or we need to concentrate here, Artie knows that I'm not just a security guy sitting in there saying what we do without any understanding or having thought about the implication to the business. And that automatically gives me credibility with him that I might not necessarily have if I just walked in as only a security angle. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And Eric just typed in the chat box and was hoping that you might be able to uh, further explain the security of the service. So as you think about the operationalization of your global technology risk management group, uh, if you can share just a bit more about your view of thinking about how you rolled that out at, from a security as a service uh, uh, you know, approach, uh, what did that look like and, and how does that take place? Yeah, it, it's actually simpler than it sounds um, if you think of it at the conceptual level. And, and truly, if you look at what a, a lot of companies do, because they, they're outsourcing to an MSSP or whatever the case is, um, it's really kind of the same concept, only it's internal. And when it's internal, it gives me a whole lot of inherent advantage. Number one, I know our business better than any other outside company ever will, um, or at least I should if I've done my homework correctly. Therefore, I know how I can implement that at what pace I can do that and um, what you know, the, the, the costing structure is going to be and what are the roadblocks going to be and all those other things. So essentially, if, if I were to simplify it, it would be like imagining yourself as um, an outsourcer of every one of those security components, whether it be firewall management, vulnerability management, um, who's looking after the... Um, uh, the uh, antivirus and anti-malware, whatever the case is. And, and so we just take those disciplines, if you think of them as security solutions, and, and, and make them packages. And we will go out and, and find the right vendor. We do the design, the build. Now, for me, the important part was to get run out of the building because I am never going to staff to be able to be an operational center to do 146 countries in all those time zones and do all of those other things. So, uh, but when we go to the market, all of those aspects of the design and the build and the licensing and what it takes to run it and the operational side of it and all those other things, that is all Wizard of Oz. Right? That's completely behind the curtain. And whether I'm doing it with all duct tape or whatever color box my antivirus and anti-malware is coming out of, um, I ask the markets that they don't care. What I do is I gather their requirements and say, what do you need this thing to do? And they come back with some pretty unique and crazy things and they all have different POS systems and stuff like that. So it's certainly challenging. Um, but at the end of the day, we gather those requirements, we produce that thing. Um, and then at essentially no cost, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a wash, you know, effectively. Um, what it also allows me to do that they wouldn't normally be able to do is that for the onset of those services, I contribute corporate money to those. So we can build a world-class solution. I know that it's being built by people who actually know what they're doing and do security for a living. And then operationally, we can distribute that um, just at the cost of operating it. So uh, I've contributed the corporate investment, but then I can repeat that across 146 different markets. Whereas the other way to do that was that 146 markets were literally going out and trying to find these solutions and these point things. And half the time, you know, one, that's a horrible negotiation position. Um, the second one is that they really didn't have the right people, you know, to do that and then run it. As we all know, these things rarely fail because whose technology you used 
um, where they really fail is because somebody who's you know competent and knows what they're doing isn't operating them on a daily basis. So you know that's that's the advantage, but that's that's essentially how we compartmentalize the services. Yeah, thanks for that clarity, Mark. I appreciate it. One last question. We've got a few minutes here remaining, and I had mentioned that I was going to come back to the point of empathy. Uh, and, and certainly your role uh, in security, uh, empathy is needed. Uh, so too is the, the kind of the variable of hope. You know, there, there's so much that you face as well as other security officers face uh, that is negative. And, and, you know, that's often what we attribute, it, attribute security for. There's something negative happening or is going to happen. And so, therefore, empathy for individuals and an aspect of hope, uh, I, I suspect, is quite valuable and needed in the role you play, but probably not just as a security officer, but as you mentioned earlier, you also clarified that you're a corporate vice president. You know, from a leadership perspective, what is the importance of such variables, the soft variables, if you will, of empathy for individuals and, and to instill hope in individuals in the work they're doing and the contributions that they're making? Yeah, it's a great point. I would quickly, I would, I would capture that in two ways. One is how you communicate that to upward stream. So I find, you know, my, my leadership at first, you know, was, was, really their expectation was to come in and, and hear the doom and gloom and like, okay. And it was, you know, listening to Eeyore talk about how bad things were and what we were going to be working on and all these other things. And, you know, I, I found a lot of my time being captured by saying, well, these things are, are, you know, challenges and we've got to get them fixed. But here's, I spend a lot of my time saying, but here's what we've put in place. Here's the progress that we're making. And we're doing it because nobody wants to constantly hear that drone of, of, you know, it's it's always bad. It's never getting better. Um, I think we do we can fall into that trap as security people because it gets us backing. I think it's a very temporal thing, where it's more important to me that you give a very objective view of where you were, and then what is the general progress that you're making against those things. Now that doesn't mean that you don't you're not honest with them and say if you know the baby's ugly, the baby's ugly, and you say that it is. But very quickly, what you want to articulate is. How are you moving beyond that and what kind of progress are you making? And then quarter over quarter over quarter, um, I, I make that reporting pretty consistent so that my board and my leadership doesn't have to spend time learning a new format of my PowerPoint because I thought that was cool. Um, I want them to easily be able to track back and see the progress that we're making. Um, so I have empathy for them because I understand what that must be like to, to under, to, you know, constantly be brought in and being, you know, beaten over the head by your security people about how bad things are and why they need more money and resource and time. Um, I think it works the other way going down downstream with, with our stats. Um, like for us, this is a hard job. Uh, it seems like we are never finished. Um, there's oh, like a, this credential stuffing thing that I mentioned before. I mean, we had just gotten one aspect of our WAF uh, deployed in a lot of our major markets and protecting a lot of our major sites, and we really felt good for about 15 minutes. Um, and, and things were great, and, and we had the right stuff in place, and then all of a sudden, um, doing it on botnets were, were you know, now becoming far larger, and doing it manually wasn't helping anymore. We, need to, we needed to run out and put the SDK into the code because more of those attacks were coming from mobile devices than they were before, which is not something that had been predicted. And you, know, you got this team that's nine days before Super Bowl, and they are working 24 hours uh, a day trying to get something implemented that we had in good condition and nailed 14 days before that. Um, I think empathizing with sort of what does that feel like to, you know, to not be ahead so that you're making sure that people know that they're appreciated. Um, and, and for us, I made sure that our staff knew, that our leadership knew how gargantuan of a task that was and what exactly they had accomplished by being able to do that and how much it protected the business. And I think more than anything, that was greatly appreciated by the, the actual boots on the ground that were the ones working tireless, tirelessly to get that done. And really it just stems from empathy is, is understanding what that must be like and going back to those days. And I mean, I, 
I have the fortune of remembering what being in a server room at three in the morning, um, you know, was like with, you know, your contacts stuck to your eyes because of the air conditioning and absolutely no humidity. Um, and so, you know, real work, you know, I do remember that day. Um, and it's hard and it, and sometimes it can seem defeating. And I think it's really important for us to, to be able to understand that as leaders and put ourselves in that position again, because that's really what, you know, those that you're leading are dealing with every single day. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, appreciate the perspective. As always, uh, you know, you've been such a great contributor to the Academy uh, ever since we were designing this way back in the early days of 2014 and launching it and bringing it into your teams then at McDonald's and now at Yum Brand and continuing to provide your insights on leadership and your perspectives and, and mentoring other individuals that are coming up through the ranks. And just can't thank you enough. And I think, you know, I always, you know, have great takeaways and I've got three pages of notes here just based on your conversation. Uh, the importance of being intentional, asking for feedback, making sure that we do empathize with the situation and the individuals that we're working with through that situation, and always having hope and, and, and recognizing that it is a process, you know, and we are learning on the fringe of what we already know and we're helping to make others better in that process as well. And so, Mark, thanks again so much. Uh, always appreciate you and the time that you spend uh, with us and, and, and leaders and helping make other leaders better. And, you know, this is just uh, the third segment in this webinar series for the year. Uh, we will stay in touch with everyone uh, here on the call. We will be joined by Michael uh, Santarcangelo uh, next time. He's the founder of the Security Catalyst organization, and we'll look forward to that. Uh, Mark, thanks so much. Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today for this webinar. We hope everyone has a fantastic day and uh, this will be available online here as soon as we uh, finish the recording and post it up to our learning management system. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.